Welcome to this week's episode of VMNN, where we have a VM skeptic and a, a VM enthusiast come together and hash out all things cloud VMs. Uh, Brian, thanks for being here. Absolutely. I think today is networking, right? It is networking because last time you left me off feeling really good about VMs and I'm like, this can't stand. <laughs> we've got we've to gotta go deeper and figure it out. So could you tell me from a big picture overview, uh, what is networking like once you're you know, using Google's infrastructure and all that? Yeah. And I, I, honestly, I think this is one of the, the main reasons to consider running a virtual machine in Google Cloud. Um, because the traffic back and forth to the machine runs mostly across the network that Google built to serve traffic for things like Gmail and YouTube and, and the like. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, you know, the big reason. When you say the network Google built, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very precise set of terminology. It sounds like someone actually picked up tools and, and built like hardware for this. Yeah, and ran undersea fiber cable and, you know, built a whole bunch of things. So you know, we've got cables we've laid and, you know, lease space on other cables, um, all to, you know, reduce the latency because the, the faster your information gets to people, um, the more like, I mean, we've just seen research that people bounce off of pages that are slow. Yeah. So you want to be fast, as fast as you can be. Okay. So then what's this like for people that aren't on Google? Like what is the, say, say, what is the network like? taking Google Cloud out of it? Like, what's it like for a piece of traffic? What happens? Yeah. So if, um, you know, if you've got a machine that's somewhere, you know, in a data center or, you know, actually even, you know, on a, a home network somewhere um, and somebody else connects to it, it'll jump across a bunch of hops mm -hmm. and different like uh, routers and machines on the internet and make it, it's the packet makes its way there and then makes its way back. And this is kind of the, like we've kind of forgotten what an amazing piece of technology this is, you know, yeah. the internet itself, you know, it can route around problems and um, get the traffic there. And it may take a different route depending on how busy things are and other stuff, but it does mean that there is kind of an unpredictability in the route and the timing that that takes. So there's a certain amount of, kind of just variation that happens there. Right. So yeah. one of the things we do is kind of built out dedicated networking and, you know, the traffic will kind of come out of a Google machine, go across Google's network, and then pop out somewhere close to the end user, still on the public internet, but fewer hops between them and the actual service. Um, and I think that's the, the, the key kind of benefit, I guess, um, you know, both for Google's services and for yours that run here. And right. so I think at a high level, the, it comes down to kind of consistency, kind of predictability mm -hmm. of, the, of that. And then... There's another fun thing that we'll dig into here of just, you know, some of these networking pieces we offer as a service rather than like a particular piece of hardware that's doing it. I've heard of software as a service and infrastructure as a service. I've never heard of networking as a service. What does this mean, Brian? Yeah. So the the industry term for it is, you know, software defined networking. Mm -hmm. um, and the the networks that your VMs see are an entirely software defined thing. Um and running on top of the networking fabric, you know, that, you know, runs the data center. So we've got this extremely high speed, like well interconnected physical network. Mm -hmm. And we run a software defined network on top of that. And that allows things like firewalls and load balancers to be provided, like, again, this slice of a data center yeah. instead of a slice of a particular computer. Um, the data center is the firewall and the data center is the load balancer. A, a firewall is a... It's a box that you plug in between. So what do you mean the firewall, firewall is a data center? I'm... Yeah. So um, so instead of a box that you plug in, you know, one side of the network and the other side of the network, right? Um, the, the firewall that you're using uh, for your VMs and, you know, for you know, deciding what ports are open and that sort of thing, there are a set of rules. And then instead of those rules going to one box that's in between, the implementation of the software-defined network itself enforces those rules and that's distributed across the whole data center. Mm, and so instead of like having, Oh, my box can't handle more. Google can handle all of this for you. So you get firewall at scale firewalls at scale. Exactly. And where that becomes really important is the load balancer at scale. Mm. Um, so, um, and it, it seems like really counterintuitive. So I want to, I want to, instead of a particular box that, you know, the traffic hits and it spreads it around to a whole bunch of backend machines, right? Right. Um, again, you're setting 
kind of rules, but there's still, it provides this endpoint. It provides one IP address um, that you see and, and routes the traffic to all of them. But there's not just one box doing it. This is inter like I need to know how this works because this is this is what Google like G uh, Gmail YouTube uses all this. Exactly. How? Um, and in <laughs> fact, we're configuring those same load balancers. And luckily for for us, um, Google published a paper about this, um, and the the infrastructure is called Maglev. So let's put a link to that paper down okay. below. But at a at a really high level, it, it allows multiple computers, an arbitrary number of them, so you can just keep adding them, to all implement the same exact load balancing rules in sync. So that, you know, when you change the rules or, you know, one of your backend machines needs to go offline, you bring a different one up, all of the load balancing, you know, cluster essentially handles that for you. And there's a like distributed hashing and a bunch of like neat stuff that makes that possible. Um, this listed in that paper. You're giving me homework. I got to go read about this now. Um, yep. So this uh, last episode, we touched on networking a little bit and you brought up managed instance groups, if I'm correct. Yep. This, this is the technology that makes that possible. Yeah. So um, managed instance groups, I think are the, the kind of like n next level on top of that. So once you've got the ability to kind of route traffic to a whole bunch of different computers, mm -hmm. um, how do you figure out which computers and whether they're working and that sort of thing? That's where managed instance groups come in into play. Okay. And so something I keep hearing uh, just repeatedly, everyone says global, global. Google has a global network. Um, I, I don't necessarily know what that means. Uh, can, can you... Can you help clarify? Yeah, and I guess I made the claim that you know that your managed instance group could have machines that are spread around the globe, right? right. You know, so it, it at some level it means exactly that, right? So our network we've put down fiber, and the we have data centers that are in lots of different places and really fast, you know, as fast as possible. You still have light speed, mm -hmm. you know, there, but there as fast as possible, interconnect between them, um, and. I, I think the key concepts to take away as you're planning your system um, is that we kind of group things in a hierarchy. So at the top, you've got global, you know, something that, you know, uh, uh, an IP address that could be accessed from anywhere in the world. Okay. And then regional, which might be something like, you know, Europe or, you know, North America or, you know, Asia, something like that. And then zonal. And conceptually, that's kind of like a data center. It's at least a... Uh, interconnected set of hardware, you know, machines, networking, power, uh, redundancy that mm -hmm. is all one unit. And and the idea is that if there is a failure in one zone, it shouldn't affect another zone. So you can choose to put things in different zones and trust that they're unlikely to, you know, have the same, you know, issue that affects each other. Okay. Um, so then you get data redundancy and backups, all of that from zones. Yeah. Um, so that's how you build reliability, you know, into your system so that you can kind of keep things separate and the managed instance group can, uh, can cross those and, um, uh, it's really useful. And I think the one key thing to just kind of keep in the back of your head is that, um, communication tends to be faster within a zone and cheaper. Things are and closer together. You know, it takes a little extra time and costs a little more money to, to cross, you know, between zones. I think at this point, we've talked about high level benefits of using clouds networking. I, I can't poke any holes in the argument just now. Like I, it looks like it's very useful for VM users. Um, but I, I, I know that can't be like all of the benefits. Like, you know, so what I'm curious about, what are the other like core concepts? Uh, we've talked high level. Are there any lower level concepts that you're like, this is really cool? Yeah. So we've already kind of talked about firewalls, load balancers, you know, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, which kind of implies kind of public IP addresses. But I think there's a couple other, I don't know, just words like terminology that we should, <laughs> we should talk about a bit. Um, what you got? And, you know, one of those is VPC networks. Mm. And then the other concept is like, how do you connect to these networks from other places? Okay. I hear virtual private cloud all the time. Uh, yeah. I'm confused because I, it, I kind of thought that's what like a Google cloud, cloud network. Yeah. I'm kidding. What is virtual <laughs> private cloud? <laughs> I think in this context, it's easiest just to think of it as like the collection of services that provide networking for us. So you, a, a VPC network is kind of a, a security boundary, if you will. It's the, it's the name of our networking bits. Um, so everything. And, so kind of everything, but to be more concrete, since that's kind of vague, um, 
when you create a project and you create a VM, um, by default, there is a, a network uh, that is created. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we just call that the, the default network. Um, and it provides private, non-routable IP addresses. So the public internet is all you know on the main pool of IP addresses. And there's a couple pools that are never meant to be routed. Mm-hmm. So routers will never kind of send them across the public internet. And so we use one of those, the 10 dot, you know, series of networks as a default and expose that to you and all of your VMs by default live on that network, wherever they are. So if they're whatever zone they're in, they're all on the same 10 dot network. Oh, wow. Um, so I can just address them like they're right next to me everywhere. What about, okay, here's an interesting one. What if, uh, so like if I have a VPC and you have a VPC, uh, 10.1.1, yep. is that shared like, or do we get our own separate one? Yeah. So that is a non-routable private address space. So you can't ever have collisions with other people. And my 10.1.1.1 will be different than yours. And we'll, you know, the things will never move across uh, that, that way. That simplifies a lot of networking. Yes. Uh, okay. I, I'm, uh, I want to be skeptical, but that, uh, okay. Okay. So let me add one on that. Yes. The, the, another thing along those lines is that, um, you know, when you create a VM, you give it a host name mm-hmm. and we automatically provide DNS of name lookup based on those names for all the machines. So you can just ping another VM by its host name wherever it is in the world in whatever network and it just simplifies a lot of yeah, yeah that that okay automation what about if i wanted to bring on a like my own ip address a public ip address because this is all private is there a way to do that yes yep um there sure is and so we have um both this com you know uh concept of ephemeral ip addresses so if you mm-hmm. if you just make a machine and say i want to have a public ip address and i don't care what it is you can do that um, and then most of the time you actually want a kind of long lived address so that maybe you can give it a DNS entry and, you know, make it my website.com instead of, you know, a series of numbers. Right. Um, and those can be either attached to a particular VM when you start up. And if you just have one computer, that's handy. Um, but often you actually attach it to the load balancer and the load balancer becomes that long lived stable endpoint and the machines come and go behind the scenes. Okay, that's smooth. So, all right, how do I get started with this? Uh, how do I take, like, uh, say I have some uh, on-prem system. I want to connect to Google Cloud's network. How do I do this? Yeah. So uh, I'll take that in two phases. So getting started, you know, the, the networking kind of is, is there by default, and then you kind of add the pieces as you need them, you know, rules or load balancers or what have you. Uh, but this connectivity bit, um, that's that's interesting, right? So the the main one I talked about so far is, you know, via the public internet. And we try to get off the internet as quick as we can, but, you know, things are routed across there. Mm-hmm. And that's using just the normal wide open protocol. So you you may want to use something that's encrypted if, these days, that sort of thing, if you can, but it's running across the public internet. Usually that's not what people want when you think about, hey, I want to connect my servers right. to the cloud. Um, and so we have a couple of different ways of doing that. Um, one is setting up a, a VPN, a virtual private network. And we have um, a kind of a hosted IPsec VPN termination. So you can use the IPsec protocol using whatever hardware or software you have and mm-hmm. connect that to the cloud network. And then your machines on one end and your cloud machines can just talk to each other as if they're on the same network. And then you said there's a, you said that was two of the main ones. There's another... At, and then there's another sometimes. So that's still running across the public internet, but encrypted. Okay. So it's safe, but you know, occasionally you have a use case where you need to get the latency down as low as you possibly can. Yeah. And you know, there's nothing that really beats colocation. You put the machines in the same places, right? So we have something called Cloud Interconnect that allows you to um, kind of get a you know rack space. In inside a, a warehouse hosting provider, inside well inside a hosting provider that we have a, a connection with, um, or with partners who do the same, and so you get like right there where the the network's terminated, and you know never leave the private data centers. All right, Brian, I got to be honest, uh, it's getting hard to be skeptical at this point. Like you're you're doing a good job. Uh, it, it sounds cool. I guess I have. All right, if I had to ask one last question, uh, it's going to sound like a gotcha, but I don't mean it to be. 
what are the advantages or why would someone want to work at this level, the infrastructure level, over working at, say, the Kubernetes level, where I could still work with the cloud load balancer, but a lot of choices have been made. I don't have to deal with all the nitty gritty. Yeah. And, you know, there's some real big advantages to, you know, having kind of a, a curated experience. Like Kubernetes sets a bunch of stuff up. It handles, you know, authentication even between, you know, the the connections and, you know, gives you these um nice abstractions, you know, and so you, mm -hmm. you get this kind of endpoint you can connect to. So if you're already running a cluster, I, I think you should keep doing that. Um, that said, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of apps that just don't run in Kubernetes maybe yet or maybe ever. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes you want to use a lot of these same patterns. And I think, you know, this static endpoint, you know, of a load balancer, you know, in front of, even if it's just one machine is actually a very useful pattern. Um, and so, you know, I think it's worth, um, keeping that in mind. Um, there's a few additional options. I don't think those are, are super key. Um, but I think, I think there's kind of compatibility with other things that are going on. You know, if you've got a bunch of services, you know, in Kubernetes and you want to add a few more that are not in Kubernetes, um, it's really useful to be able to do that. And then I think, yeah. you know, what we talked about earlier, where sometimes you have a system that's just, you know, doesn't have as many moving parts and you don't necessarily want to set up a whole cluster to do that. Um, it's a really nice way to get similar patterns uh, with way less complexity. That makes a lot of sense. And I like what you said about like Kubernetes as a curated uh, approach to cloud. Um, you don't always want or need that curation. And so it sounds like working at this level, you get a lot of great power, uh, <laughs> great power. You get power, you get flexibility. Uh, and that comes with responsibility. So if you're a, you're a strength trainer or a yogi, know that you have responsibilities. <laughs> um, Actually, exactly I, that. And I want to just riff on that for a moment. I think that um, that concept you described there is true, you know, across the VMs. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you you get a little more control and you have to do a little more or you can kind of work up the layers if, you know, that's the right fit for you. Right. This is why I like talking with you, Brian. We riff and it makes me very happy. Um, thinking of these riffs in the future and why I think we should do this again. What uh, you said you want to talk about security in the future. So let's definitely do that. What else do yep. we need to talk about? Yeah, I think I think the next thing I want to talk about, just because I'm so excited about them, is the the disks. I want to go into more detail about how they work and what um, extra capabilities they give you that you might not be thinking of. You really love disk. I do. You know, all right. Next episode, why don't we talk about disk? Let's do it. All right. Well, yo, uh, thank you all for listening and checking this out, Brian. You're slowly but surely convincing me. I'm not happy to admit it, but here we are. Um, thank you again for coming in and talking. Thank you much. See y'all next episode.